a countdown for launch of Space Shuttle Columbia on mission STS-107 is continuing on schedule this morning. Sequence start, T minus 20 seconds and counting. Seven, we have a go for main engine start. Five, four, three, two, one. We have booster ignition and liftoff at Space Shuttle Columbia. Investigation by NASA into the cause of the Space Shuttle Columbia accident on Saturday, February 1, 2003, has been called the biggest and most complicated puzzle in aviation and aeronautics history. Shortly after the accident, President Bush enacted an emergency declaration for the states of Texas and Louisiana, and then called on FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, to coordinate the shuttle response and recovery effort with federal, state, and local governments and volunteer agencies. In turn, FEMA designated US EPA lead agency for the collection, removal, and data management of potentially hazardous Space Shuttle Columbia materials. We got our support people in here and we started operating uh, on Saturday afternoon on a 24-hour basis. Uh, and then things quickly escalate and so we obviously had to get additional help and not only did we go to our backup regions but essentially went on a national basis to bring in additional OSCs from around the country to assist region six in this effort. When Columbia broke apart during its re-entry into Earth's atmosphere, materials scattered over a 10 mile by 240 mile corridor stretching from eastern Texas into western Louisiana, an area larger than the state of West Virginia. EPA's ASPECT, or Airborne Spectral Photoimaging of Environmental Contaminants Technology Aircraft, initiated air operations the day of the accident to locate potentially hazardous materials. Forward looking, downward looking, all right, sensors on. We flew roughly from the base of operation here in Waxahachie, Texas, down to Morgan City, Alvora, Louisiana, and then up to Shreveport, looking primarily for uh, monomethyl hydrazine in the atmosphere. What we do is we, we have two sensors. One is an infrared line scanner that, that paints an image of the plume or the cloud, and a high-speed Fourier transform infrared spectrometer that we use to actually query the plume, uh, make compound identification and quantitation. From the results of that flight, we didn't detect any of that material, which is, is beneficial from a public health standpoint. EPA's TAGA, or Trace Atmospheric Gas Analyzer, a self-contained mobile laboratory, was also put into service. The TAGA lab was able to collect real-time outdoor air quality samples at extremely low concentrations while driving through East Texas. Results of the TAGA revealed no detectable levels of hazardous substances. FEMA established a disaster field office in Lufkin, Texas, as headquarters for all federal and state response agencies. Early on, we established three major objectives for this operation. The first one was to ensure public safety. And they'll go through all the same training that you folks went through. Do that, I think we'd stay a lot healthier and safer out there. That's basically to find the hazardous areas and hazardous material and neutralize it and render it safe. And the second was retrieve the human remains. And the third one is to gather evidence for the investigation. Estimated to be the largest deployment of civilian government agencies in history, the recovery has drawn close to 5,600 people from 39 states. EPA alone has dispatched 900 responders to the scene. To ensure the recovery would run smoothly, FEMA tasked the Texas Forest Service to implement the Incident Command System, bringing all responding agencies together under one authority. 
incident command system really allows agencies with different missions to come together and work for a common effort. And it has five functions, command, operations, planning, logistics, and finance. And everything that occurs on an incident occurs under one of those five functions. Environmental Protection Agency is one of those that has made an effort to adopt the incident command system, and it was much easier to fold them into the operation than maybe some of the other agencies. The operation in which we're involved has had two fairly distinct but overlapping phases. Initially, our mission was to collect materials and service requests from citizens, and we had a very large number of requests for that. EPA has a variety of resources available here. We've been able to use the Gulf Coast Strike Team from the Coast Guard. We have a huge number of contractor resources, both our Stark contractor and our ERS contractor, and we use a very large number of EPA employees. Whatever is in between us, we'll work it out as we go. Phase one ground recovery consisted of 60 on-scene coordinator-led teams operating from five regional base camps, each working with a multi-county jurisdiction. We have a seven-county area surrounding this area where we're coordinating all of the collection activities in the counties. We have on-scene coordinators in each of the counties working with the county officials, trying to coordinate and prioritize the locations that material need to be picked up. Today's been going fairly smoothly. We're assigned regions within the county and given points to go and collect material that's already been flagged and GPSed for us. And basically our crew's going in behind the original crews that ID'd the material and we are uh, taking down information and uh, going ahead and bagging and tagging those items. Most property owners walk their property after the announcement. We'll be going down to the steel off, off to the right here. We do a, a PID photo ionization detector for volatile organics. If it's an unknown, we'll, we'll scan it for radiation. We will then take our GPS unit, find the exact location. We'll go ahead and, and label it with an evidence board, take a, take a digital picture of it, and then we'll, we'll bag it. Uh, the silver nice. It's on 459, I believe. There's uh, a mark right there. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Two of them. On the average, we process, or what we call clear, approximately 10 to 15 sites per day by by working methodically through our sector like all the other teams do the goal is to clear out a county I would say an average county over the course of three to five days materials received by the four regional collection sites in Palestine Nacogdoches Corsicana and Hemp Hill were then shipped to Barksdale Air Force Base in Louisiana before being forwarded to NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Florida for final identification. Until the cause of the Columbia accident was determined, all future shuttle missions were indefinitely grounded. Driven by the knowledge that each piece of debris, from the smallest to the largest, might provide the missing clue investigators were looking for, responders worked nonstop through the rain and cold searching the thickets, pastures, and piney woods of East Texas. The interagency cooperation during the massive undertaking was unprecedented. NASA is familiar with dealing with other federal agencies, but I'll have to tell you that I believe that, that this event has brought more agencies together in the shortest period of time that I've ever, that I've ever experienced and has put together a, a team that has just really performed in an excellent manner. The coordination and cooperation has been excellent. As part of that multi-agency effort, EPA dive teams also assisted with underwater search and recovery efforts. Today's task is the uh, investigation of an eyewitness report of a piece of shuttle material hitting the small pond behind me. Now the unit is doing a wade through in a shallower area where the heavy weeds are with an underwater metal detector to confirm that we've tried as best we could to, to look at everything possible as far as a small one acre pond. The U.S. Navy coordinated dive team operations from the Toledo Bend Reservoir on the Texas-Louisiana border. 145 responders from nine federal, 
state and local agencies collaborated to search the cold, murky waters. EPA's environmental response dive team utilized side scan sonar on the lake to help pinpoint potential search targets. The tools we're utilizing on this is side scan sonar, which sends a high frequency sound wave across the lake bottom in depths of 10 to 50 feet of water and sends an image back to us real time on a screen, which we can then evaluate, record, and further evaluate to determine those images that appear most likely to be a man-made object. We have identified targets we consider high priority, which we will then further evaluate with ROVs and divers, which includes EPA divers from Region 7 out of Kansas City, as well as my dive team out of Edison, New Jersey, along with other state, county, and federal dive units. By mid-February, phase two of the search effort was underway with over 3,500 wild firefighters trained in pattern search procedures scouring the 33,000 square mile recovery zone. At the request of the Texas Forest Service, large base camps were erected near the four incident command posts, each housing upwards of 1,000 responders. To manage the large crews now needed for the phase two ground recovery, the Forest Service again utilized the incident command system. We brought in four incident management teams, which are made up of 30 to 50 trained personnel uh, trained in implementing the incident command system. And then we have uh, brought in 3,000 searchers that are comprised of 20-person hand crews. These are the crews that go out in the field and suppress the fires. The objective today is to complete the area inside the game fence line using the search techniques working from the west to the east towards us. My role in this operation is a group supervisor responsible for the management of, of the resources assigned to this group in this search grid pattern that we have. Uh, right now we have about 180 people out searching. We have about four strike teams is what it equates to. We've set up the grid technique and from search and rescue folks that have given us some direction and we've implemented that in the field. And we move from grid to grid, day to day, and the object is to always move forward or in a new direction. An EPA team accompanies each squad to inspect, bag, tag, and catalog material. EPA is also tasked with the data management of recovered shuttle materials. Information about each piece is first loaded into PDAs in the field. Then, that same evening, the data is uploaded to a web-based server, making the data available for analysis by NASA to refine the search strategy and aid in the investigation. The Space Shuttle Columbia contained a number of potentially hazardous liquids and gases used as fuel and coolant, including hydrazine, monomethylhydrazine, nitrogen tetroxide, and hydrous ammonia liquid hydrogen, and liquid oxygen. Whenever hazardous materials were located, special remediation teams were dispatched to secure the site and mitigate any threat. These EPA-led teams were assisted by other federal and state response agencies trained in hazardous materials remediation. The particular piece of debris that we're here for is a titanium spherical cylinder that was used to hold an oxidant as part of the thruster system for the, the Columbia. EPA is supplying some of the, the technical expertise and the civil support team is supplying the actual manpower to do the actual operation and the treatment work in this case. The product inside is nitrogen tetroxide, which is one of the more dangerous chemicals that have been found on the shuttle. What we've been asked to do is come out here and uh, do some uh, hasty mitigation on it, and what we're going to do is we're going to pull the, the cylinder away from the affected ground, and we're going to heat the, the actual ball of the sphere up with uh, either halogen lights or some other source of heat, so it'll help off-gas the product inside. Helicopter 790 Bravo Hotel, report 2 northeast. 
Helicopter 1 Echo Alpha Report to North Northwest, Buck Canal Altimeter 2901. The Texas Forest Service, the U.S. Forest Service, and NASA also coordinated extensive air search operations over the debris field. In clear weather, air crews covered close to 2,000 miles a day. 36 helicopter and 10 fixed-wing aircraft flew search grids, making passes at treetop and ground level. Helicopter crews also retrieved items for preliminary inspection. If geography made touchdown difficult, material location was GPSed and forwarded to ground recovery crews. As of April 9th, over 60,000 shuttle debris items had been retrieved and delivered to Kennedy Space Center, truly a testament to the long hours and commitment made by every responder. The tragedy of why we're here is sad, but the, the outcome of this is absolutely heartwarming and uplifting. I think our ability to, to hit the ground and get energized and be up to full speed in the time, time frame that we've done is, is just really a uh, tribute to the cooperation and the leadership that we've seen in these various teams. They've just, they've just done a great job. They're still excited about coming out every day. You know, there's always the possibility that we're going to find something very, very significant, and I think that drives them every day. And they understand the, the significance of this tragedy that's happened that, that keeps them going. Our goal and our mission here is protection of public health and the environment. That's precisely what we're doing. Many people say from many perspectives that this is unprecedented in nature, and I think there's certainly truth to that. For example, we have not worked with NASA before. We're very saddened by the circumstances which have brought us together here. However, the uh, teamwork has been uh, really quite excellent. Moving. Moving. Moving.